and I'll go ahead and record and then you're all set to begin closed session roll call. Okay. Amanda? Yes, council member. Is uh, commissioners going to be online with us over here too? The uh, planning commissioners? Yes, they'll be on at the workshop at 6 p.m., um, but they will not be part of closed session. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, Madam City Clerk. This is Amanda again. I just want to let you know that uh, everything is all set up so you can begin the meeting at any time. Okay. <clears throat> all right. That being said, um, we are ready to open the Gardena City Council special. Um, I'm sorry. We're ready to open up the meeting right now uh, for Wednesday, March 31st, 2021. Madam City Clerk, will you call the roll, please? Mayor Serta. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Henderson. Here. Councilmember Cascanian. Present. Councilmember Tanaka. Here. And Councilmember Francis is um, on an excused absence. And that concludes okay. our roll call. Okay, thank and I'll you. I'll be leaving right now. Oh, wait, wait, hold do, on, do, hold on. Do, oh, before, comment. do we have I'm anybody um, from, no, that's okay. Do we have anybody from the public wishing uh, to speak on any closed session items? No, Madam Mayor, we do not. Okay. So at this time, you can go ahead and excuse yourself. And, Thank you, uh, Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So we will now log off this application and go into the team's uh, information that Becky sent you in the same email. Once we're done with closed session, then we will come back on to this Zoom link. And this, this is where the housing workshop element will be uh, conducted. Correct. Okay. All right. Everybody log off. Thanks.
Good evening, everybody. This is Amanda Acuna. I'm a part of the planning staff here for the city of Gardena. And as our city attorney, Assistant City Attorney Lisa Cranis mentioned, we are just waiting for city council to return from their closed session before we begin tonight's uh, virtual workshop on the city of Gardena's housing element update. Uh, I thought we'd take this time to uh, go ahead and provide to you all uh, any our contact info. So you could take this down at this time. Let me go ahead and uh, share that with everybody. One moment, sorry about that. Go ahead. Oops. Sorry about that. Let me go ahead and share my screen again. Okay, let me try this one more time. Okay, there we go. Sorry for the delay there. Uh, so uh, that is my direct email and our planning line here. Uh, if you would like further information or any other notices um, in in regards to our housing element update process, as well, you can find information on our city's website, cityofgardena.org slash housing dash element backslash. Uh, and again, if any of uh, you can feel free to email me directly or feel free to give us a call during uh, uh, City Hall hours. And hopefully City Council will be joining us back from closed session and momentarily. Thank you.
we've been advised the council's wrapping up and should be on any minute. Lisa, um, this is uh, Tasha Serta. I'm here. Oh, okay, great. If all the council's on, we're ready to start. Okay. Mark, are you here? I am here, ready to learn. Okay. <laughs> Tanaka's here. Tanaka, okay. Art? Art, are you here? Okay. Clint, are you in? I am here. Okay. Um, Carmen, are you on? I am, Madam Mayor. So let's do the closed session report and the adjournment, and then we can start the workshop. Okay, one second. I don't know if Art's in yet. Art, um, if you're on, let's see. I don't see. I'm here. Don't see. Okay, you're here? Okay. All right. Okay, I think we have everybody here, and um, we have now returned from a uh, closed session. Uh, Madam City Clerk, will you call the roll again, please? Yes, Madam Mayor. Mayor Serta. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Henderson. Here. Uh, Council Member Cascanian. Present. Council Member Tanaka. Here. And uh, for the record, uh, Council Member Francis is um, on excused absence. And shall I call roll for the uh, Planning Commission at this time? Uh, not, uh, not yet. Not yet. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Carmen. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Mayor. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, I'll 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 advise in just one second for that. Thank you, um, Madam City Attorney. Do we have anything to report from closed session? No, Madam Mayor. There was no reportable action taken tonight. Okay. So at this time, we're going to close out of this part here, and we're going to go to our next meeting. Let me just pull up my next agenda here. Okay. So we are now ready to begin the Gardena City Council and Planning and Environmental Quality Commission, second virtual uh, workshop on the City of Gardena's housing element. This is a special meeting and workshop. Um, Madam City Clerk, will you call the roll, please? And, and actually, if you can call the City Council first, and then yeah. afterwards, if you can call the Planning Commission. Thank, Thank you. you. Count, uh, Mayor Serta. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Henderson. Here. Council Member Cascanian. Present. Council Member Tanaka. Here. Uh, Council Member Francis is um, abs is on excuse absence. Okay. And I will call the Planning Commission. Commissioner Chair Brenda Jackson. Commission Chair Ms. Jackson. Commission Vice Chair Sherman. Commissioner Henderson, Commissioner Pierce. Here. Commissioner Langley. Here. That concludes our role. Okay. Um, so as we begin this meeting here, um, let me just read this uh, quick verbiage here. In order to minimize the spread of the COVID-19 virus, Governor Newsom has issued executive orders that temporarily suspends the requirement of the Brown Act. Please be advised that the council chambers are closed to the public and that some or all of the Gardena City Council members and planning commissioners may be attending this meeting telephonically. If you would like to participate in the meeting, you can participate via the following options. The first way to participate is during the meeting via Zoom. Join the Zoom meeting via the internet or via phone conference. The direct URL is https semicolon forward slash forward slash us 02 us forward slash j forward slash 863-22-530-568. The meeting ID number is 863-2253-0568. The telephone number is area code 669-900-9128. And the, um, if you wish to speak live on a, spe a specific agenda item during the meeting, you may use the raise your hand feature during the item you wish to speak on. Members of the public wishing to address the city council or planning commission will be given um, uh, three minutes to speak. And uh, the City of Gardena thanks you in advance for helping us take all the precautions to prevent the spreading of the COVID-19 virus. So at this time, I am going to uh, turn the meeting over to um, Greg. 
um, Greg McLean, who is our uh, interim uh, director. And Greg, I'll let you go ahead and uh, introduce uh, the other members of the uh, workshop panel. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, welcome to everybody who has uh, joined us for this uh, workshop. First, I'd like to introduce the housing element team. I'm starting with myself. My name is Greg McLean. I am the interim community development director. Um, the next is the senior planner for this is Amanda Acuna. And we also have on the line with us today, Brian Ramirez. He's our intern works on this project. And Lisa Kranitz is the assistant city attorney who is assisting us on this and all other matters related to the general plan and other um, important matters for the city. Not with us tonight, but with us on the, in the last work, uh, workshop was uh, Veronica Tam of Veronica Tam and Associates. She's our housing consultant. Her uh, major tasks are to come right after this workshop. Also Starla Barker of DeNovo Planning Group is working on the environmental aspects of this, and her uh, assistant is Amanda Tropiano. The next slide, please. So tonight's agenda, we are going to go through the process of site identification um, for the housing element, and we're going to discuss the various strategies that we'll be using. These are going to be including projects that are already in the pipeline, projects where someone has expressed an interest in developing residential on, on their property or on a property, um, underdeveloped and vacant residential sites. We're gonna discuss ADUs, which is accessory dwelling units. We're also going to be discussing um, housing overlay and rezoning opportunities. This will be the bulk of the discussion tonight. And then church overlays will be the last part. And this applies to all religious institutions. During each of these segments, there will be opportunity for us to open the, um, I guess the virtual floor, if you will, for question and answers. So when you see the um, Q and A signed, there's an opportunity. You can use the raise your hand option, and we will call or we will allow you to um, have your speaker on for a while, and you can ask questions of staff. It is important to remember, though, that all of the discussion and all of the questions or comments must be. Um, pertinent to this uh, agenda item, which is the housing element. Anything that's off topic will, will not be discussed tonight. So we'll conclude with a, made, uh, with a um, general uh, Q&A about the housing element. And that's the, that's the agenda for tonight. So let's go on to the next slide. So we're gonna start with site identification. As uh, we went over in the la last, uh, workshop state law requires that cities identify sufficient sites within the boundaries of the city in their housing element to accommodate housing at each of four separate income levels. And those are the very low, low, moderate and above moderate income. Now we're gonna show you uh, what the current levels are for different size families. I'll just leave that up there for a little bit. Um, the income levels are dependent on family size. So you'll see that looking at, for example, the bottom row is moderate income. If you're a three person family or household um, and you make less than $83,500, then you're considered a, a moderate income. But if you make less than $81,100, you'll be low income and so on. But if you have another child, say, then the threshold rises to $92,750. So that's the, those are the thresholds we'll be dealing with. Um, let's see, uh, let's uh, go to the next one. Okay, for the site qualifications um, for very low and for low income housing, the zoning must be able to accommodate 30 units per acre. And for affordable sites, uh, they cannot be smaller than a half acre, and they also cannot be larger than 10 acres. So this is stuff that I believe was covered in the last workshop. It's sort of the overview, the catching up uh, where we left off. All right. So now to go over the numbers for Gardena. Now, RENA stands for Regional Housing Needs Assessment. These are the numbers that are passed down from the state through the, um, the, the uh, SCAG, which is the... Uh, Council of Governments, 
for this area. They parcel out the, the allocation for Southern California to all of the cities in this district. And Gardena's number is 5,735, which means that Gardena needs to accommodate at least 5,735 units in the general plan housing element for the next round. And they have to be divided up according to this chart. But you have to really come up with a bit more because sometimes things don't go as planned and somebody will put like a uh, McDonald's on a site that you were hoping was gonna be low income. So you kind of have to have a, a buffer in there too. We're, we're proposing to aim for a 20% buffer on the very low and the low income sites. So this shows you what the allocation is for Gardena. It's 1,485 for very low, 761 for low, 894 units for moderate, 2,595 for above moderate. So that's how we get the total. We're showing the buffer. So our goal for this exercise is 6,184 units identified in the housing element. I probably should remind everyone, it doesn't mean that we're going to see all of these built. We're not responsible to build them. We're just responsible to have them identified in our housing element. They have to be realistic and they have to be, they have to basically pass the smell test of the, the state's uh, housing community development department. So they have to be realistic and, and probable, but we don't have to build them. Most of them will, over the course of the next eight years, uh, probably not be built, but some, a great deal of them will be. Okay, next. So let's, uh, let's start going through um, each of the different strategies. First of all, we're gonna talk about sites in the pipeline. These are projects that we're going to be able to count because they're going to come online. In other words, they're gonna be occupied by residents after the new housing cycle starts. And these are already approved. So we have uh, four of them up here. So upper left corner, we have the Olson company that's uh, going to bring 50 units. Upper right, we have uh, Malia. The, I think, are we calling that Monet? I wasn't here when this one started. Um, 84 units. I believe that's Moneta. Oh. Um, for Moneta Nursery, and it was yeah, a typo. We're missing an A. Okay. That makes sense. Um, lower right corner, Normandy Courtyard, that's nine units. So that you can see there's a great variety of different size projects. They all contribute in some way. Uh, Walnut Place is 52 units. So altogether, these four projects represent 195. So that's, <clears throat> that's a good step in the right direction. We have, um, on the next slide, we have, um, these are new projects that are pending approval. These are um, in the pipeline, meaning that they've already submitted their requests for approval. They have pending public hearings before the Planning Commission or the City Council. So on the left, we have the uh, Gardena Transit Oriented Development Specific Plan. That's 265 units. On the upper right, Normandy Place, 30 units. And on the lower right is Gardena Havens with six units. So again, a great variety of size and to accommodate different needs, a different shape, uh, size of, of uh, properties. But it's, it's also indicative of, of how you can have, you know, some very large projects, but also some very small projects. And they all work together to kind of meet the needs of achieving this number. So the total of these is 301. So again, we're, it's, it's a pretty decent contribution to, re, to achieving our arena number. Okay. So here's, um, here's the second approach. We, these are just examples of properties where someone has approached us and say, I'd like to see if, if I can build some residential on these properties. Now, I'm not gonna go into any details on these particular ones because they may be very speculative still, but these are industrial and commercial properties where, that where for whatever reason, somebody thinks that they can you know, uh, buy or if they already own it, tear this down and build residential. And in many cases that is possible due to the zoning or to some change in the zoning that we might be able to do. So that's the second strategy. 
Okay. So just these examples alone would be 800, almost 900 units. So that's, that's a pretty helpful strategy. And, and these are just realistic ones that we've shown up here. Um, again, we're not gonna go into the specifics of these sites. They may not really pan out, but, but these kind of things come to us quite frequently. Okay, next slide. All right, then there's the underdeveloped and vacant residential lots. This is an example of a residential lot. You see it in the upper left corner. And then after it was built in the lower left corner, um, this is a real example of a vacant lot being developed into three units. Again, small scale, but every little bit counts. And there's a number of vacant lots around that can be um, built with residential. But there's also cases where you have, say, a single family home that's built on an R3 lot, and that can be removed and built with, say, four units. You only get credit for three because you have to, you have to um, uh, uh, count the, you, you have to subtract one for the one that was already there and then add four, so you get three. But this is another strategy we need to, we need to employ employ. So we have the underdeveloped and vacant lot strategy and, and under, so that's, uh, that's, I guess that's all I can say about that. So the next one. This is Councilman Cascana. Can I have a question? Yes, this is a good time for <clears throat> pause for questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, is the apartment considered uh, in that 5,000 units that we should, uh, you know, our goal will be? Apartments? Yeah. Yes, apartments. Condos, houses, all of them are counted. Accessory dwelling units. Yes. All counted for. Yes, they are. Oh, I see. Okay, thank you. So while we're, while we're paused on questions, does anybody else have a question? Okay, I don't see any hands raised. Anyone on the Council or Planning Commission have a question? Okay, let's move on then. Next slide. Okay. Uh, speaking of accessory dwelling units, this is another important part of our strategy. Yes. I thought I heard a question coming. No. Okay. Um, accessory dwelling units are a part of the. Uh, they're part of reality now in California. Um, these are small, uh, what we used to call granny flats, but now they're just small houses, usually in the backyard of a, of a single-family home. Um, the housing element includes a plan to incentivize and promote the creation of these. Um, we're, we're getting a steady stream of applications for these in Gardena. And what we hope is that um, from the trends that, that we've seen in the past three years that we can get to about 120 of these over the next um, several years for the, for the next housing cycle. It's not overwhelming number for, for I think it's like eight years. Okay. So now this is where we get down to the nitty gritty. And, and this is where I want to, to have the most discussion. So we'll, we'll pause after each of these slides to have Q and A if necessary. So this is the north part of the city from El Segundo to Rosecrans. And we've identified a number of places here where we think that we can improve either rezone to a residential zone where it's not, or we can put an overlay, which won't change the zone underneath, but will allow for residential to also be there. So let me explain for those who are not familiar with the zoning map. This is a simplified version of the city zoning map. The light blue represents industrial areas. Yellow represents the single family home areas. Orange and brown are for medium and high density residential areas. The pinkish red is commercial. The things with slashes on them, I believe, are the specific plans. Is that correct? Can somebody help me with that? That's the mixed use overlay zones. Oh, okay. Those are the zones where residential is already allowed by right um, at basically 25 to 30 units per acre. Okay, thank you, Lisa. And lastly, green, of course, is uh, what we call open space, but it's usually going to be schools or parks or 
it looks like some of it might be the Dominguez channel or something like that. Uh, or not, maybe not that one, but the channel that leads to it. So that gives you the basic rundown. So at the top is El Segundo Boulevard. The bottom is Rose Canyons. And this is the entire width of the city from Crenshaw to, what is that one over there? Vermont. Uh, Vermont, thank you. So I hope everybody who is familiar with this part of the city can identify which parts we've, we've, we've picked out here and flagged. The ones that are in blue are designated as potentially being 50 to 70 dwelling units per acre. The red ones are 30 to 50 dwelling units per acre. And the ones that are in the brown or tan are 23 to 30 units per acre. And there is one that looks like it's uh, 17 dwelling units per acre. So at this point, I will open it up for questions. If anybody has any specific questions about these sites, this would be a good time. The, um, the, the um, team that worked on selecting these will be available to you know, either justify or explain anything. And if not, we'll go to the next part of the city. Greg, I have a question, Councilman Cascanian. Yes. Uh, our goal is uh, 5,000 you know, residential units. I mean, there is no way for us to hit the 5,000, right? I... Well, not exactly so. We, we the, the goal is actually 6,000 because remember we have to put that buffer in. Yes. Um, you, what we're trying to present to you is throwing out every possible option. And we're gonna, we're gonna show you that we'll hit like 7,000 if we do this. And we're not going to actually need to use every single one of these. So when we get down to the nitty gritty part of it in the next couple of months, when we're at the planning commission and then when, we, when we're at the city council, we'll have whittled down some of these and maybe taken out a bunch of them to get it down to about 6,000 and 100 or so. Um, these are just, we're throwing it all out there right now. I so, mean... This will get us over over our number. I know, but it's going to be ridiculously congested city, in my opinion, if we put six thousand people or six thousand units. I'm sorry, in the city, and uh, I mean, I don't know uh, how are we going to do this. I have no idea. C Council Member Cascanian, this is Lisa Kranitz, the Assistant yes. City Attorney. I think, as Greg indicated early on, it's very unlikely that we will actually get development to 5,735 units. Um, our last housing element numbers were 397 total units. And except for the above moderate level, we didn't even meet those low numbers. But as Greg's indicated, state law requires us to identify sites where this housing can um, be placed and then change the zoning to match what the housing element states. That's one of the reasons we are looking at overlay zones. If nothing comes in in housing, we still want the commercial and industrial to be able to continue an operation as a legal use. I see, I, I, I hear you, Lisa, I know, but uh... Uh, if we if we uh, pinpoint the properties and say okay we can build here we can build there, and then the the house you know the housing authority is going to come and say oh so you guys can build it there you know, so and then the city is just going to be like the China and you know? I've been in China and I see this high rise building like 60, 70, and there is like a few hundred of them next to each other so, I mean I don't want the city to be like that. I don't know. That's my opinion. So, well, thank I mean, you, thank you, Councilman. Um, what we're trying to do today is is meet our legal obligation. But I I do understand what you're saying. I, I I think it's safe to say that we're not going to ever see this many units built. But the other thing is, um, there is not going to be any authority that says you have to build the housing there. And these are all still privately owned properties, and the owners are not obligated to build anything other than what they have. So. The, to some extent, the markets may convince a few people, but not everyone will necessarily 
feel compelled to build residential. I see. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions from the council or from the planning commission or from the public? Um, this is a good time because this is we're we're actually zeroing in on a certain part of the city, and um, so if you live in this part of the city or if you you know have an interest or work in this part of the city, this is a really good time to to um, address your concerns. Well, I'm sure people are going to enjoy having housing though, because a lot of that's uh, commercial industrial. Yeah, uh, that's why we want to have this discussion now. Um, yeah. Okay, I'm not seeing any hands come up. Okay, then let's move to the next next part of the city. Okay, here we are, Rosecrans to Redondo Beach Boulevard. Uh, this one, you can see it's uh, mostly concentrated on the major commercial streets. So we got Crenshaw again on the left. Um, we have a lot of uh, a lot of uh, the areas on Western and also on um, Rosecrans identified, and then a few other places here and there. Um, most of it is is in the 30 to 50 uh, dwelling units per acre area on the on the western side of the city. It's just like in the upper or the upper part that we saw earlier. It's 50 to 70 dwelling units to the acre. This one's pretty straightforward. Um, do we have any questions about this? Okay, then let's go on to the next one. All right, we're getting into the thin part of the city here. So um, again, uh, going down Western, we've identified properties that would be probable or likely to um, meet the tests of HCD, mostly on Western, 30 to 50 again. There's um, some properties over on, on um, uh, Redondo Beach Boulevard and a little bit south of that that are also identified. Now these, these may be, all of these may be rezoned or they may be overlays. And then there's a, one down there, I, I don't know what street that is, but it's 50 to 70. This one, incidentally, someone has approached us to do a, a specific plan. So this one may go a different direction. Um, this is Normandy Avenue, Greg. Is, that's Normandy, thank you. Yeah, I should know that, I took that one in today. Um, <laughs> Lisa, what's the cross street on that one? Oh boy, um, it's not. It's like right across. If you see the the red hash marks to the east, that's the Normandy Estate specific plan area. Um, so it's Normandy one and one six nine. Okay, thank you. One six nine to one seven eight. Correct. Yes, thank There's you. By the liquor store. And Gardena Weldon. So uh, do we have any questions about these particular sites? No, I have a, oh, this is uh, Mayor Pro Tem Henderson. I have a more overall question in okay. regards to the infrastructure in these areas, wherever a new development comes in. Mm -hmm. What does that do, whether one comes in or not? But if one does come in, what does that do for our infrastructure in regards to our our plumbing, our sewage, our technology in the street, streets wear and tear. Is the, the developer going to be responsible for beefing up that infrastructure in those areas? If they surpass the thresholds where, where you know, they, they exceed the, um, the preset um, thresholds, I guess you'd say, Yes, the, the developers would have to beef it up in order to build it. it. That, so, yeah, go ahead, Lisa. It, I was going to say, can, not exactly concurrent with this. First, we needed to get the sites down. But if you remember, the council authorized the environmental consultant not only to do the housing element, which we expect will be a negative declaration or a mitigated negative declaration, but to very quickly roll into the sequel work for the general plan update to the land use element and to the zoning changes. And as part of that, they will be doing studies for the city as to what is going to happen with the infrastructure upgrades um, or infrastructure that is needed in the areas that we're going to be identifying as the densities, which will help give us an idea of where we have to plan for and 
um, whether we have to impose development impact fees for new development. That's, that's probably where this will end up. Um, with regard to sewers, water, electricity, if there's any deficiencies, the developers generally are required to make the upgrades. And that's not just to their property, but it may extend to, to the trunk lines or wherever the source is, is um, weak. Right, so here's a uh, second part of that, is in those areas, if they do have that impact, can we uh, make the requirement that all utilities be underground? Well, generally that should be, always be the requirement for utilities running into the property. Um, the tricky part is uh, utilities that are on the street are not on their property and we won't be able to make that a condition. But when the utilities run from the street into the property, you can you can make that a condition, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, are there any other questions on this one? Okay, next slide. Going down to the southern part of the city, this is everything south of Artesia. Um, I don't think I need to explain what's going on. Same, same procedure. Most of this area is looking like it's going to be in the 17 to 23 with a little bit in the 30 to 50. One area we've selected for the higher density, 50 to 70. And no questions? Okay, next slide. All right, the last strategy that we wanted to discuss today was religious institutions. There was a law that was passed last year, I believe, called AB um, 1851, it's Assembly Bill 1851, allows affordable housing on non, by, by nonprofits, which includes um, churches, on religious institution properties. So this is a, an example that we're showing on the right. This is not in Gardena, this is actually um, the Church of the Blessed Sacrament in Placentia. Um, you can see just by looking I a, they have a lot of surplus land. And this is not uncommon with churches all over the, the country. So what we're proposing is to do what this church did. And why don't you show the, the next part of this? There we go. This was the plan that they implemented. They just basically left the church building and a few other, actually, they don't think they left anything else, just the church building. And they redesigned everything around it. And those white buildings on the left and on the right are housing. That's affordable housing that the church provides the services for the, for the residents. And they, I think they coordinate with, uh, with the county on that. But they provide the services. A nonprofit um, housing developer partnered with the church to build these. And basically, it's kind of a win-win-win for the church, for the for the residents and for the city because they got a big boost in their arena number for the, for the low income. So this is now possible under this new law. And um, this is also something that we've been approached by um, a church in Gardena. So this is hopefully something that we can use as a strategy to uh, get additional housing in land right. that's already, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. This is Mayor Sir. I have a quick question about this. You okay. mentioned that there are services attached to this. So this wouldn't be regular, uh, just rental prop. I mean, you know, uh, apartments or, or housing to just be rented, but there are services attached with this. So well, in this are we particular talking? Case, yes. Okay. Um, but I'm saying in most of these situations with religious institutions, is it a service attached to the component of it or? Well, it doesn't need to be, but in most cases it is because the churches that do this sort of thing see it as sort of a mission to provide, um, you know, housing for homeless or for people who have, um, you know, a hard time, you know, spousal abuse or something like that. So they want to provide services as well because that's it's considered part of their mission. So it fits into their their overall, you know. Um, I don't want to keep using the word mission or overuse it, but that's, that's why they do this. Um, it's not mandatory though, but that's okay, why Okay, so do. we could be looking at shelters and things like that, correct? 
It operates very differently. There's a there's a strong philosophy among a lot of these uh, in, these nonprofit institutions that the number one priority is to get people settled and get them secure in their housing because until that's done, nothing else is is really going to um, take. So the shelters are a temporary solution. They they're 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 important and they're great, but if you really want to get somebody stable. Um, this is this is the way to do it. You get them into housing, and they're 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 secure. They're there for long term, and then they start providing all the services that they need to get back into the job uh, marketplace and to get back, you know, the basic things like get a bank account and and you know get a, a PO box or at least have an address for mail and reestablish, you know, all the things that people take for credit. I mean, for for granted. I mean, so okay. that's. That's the philosophy these institutions will be following. Now, different churches or different religious institutions may take an entirely different approach. But that's the example of this particular one. Okay, so I have another question as it relates to this. Sure. So let's just say they take they, they have facilities, um, people trying to get them off the street, mm -hmm. and maybe, um, I, I guess I've seen uh, organizations like this where maybe um, the people there, they're acting out and so on. And, you know, we tried to put some requirements on them as far as saying, you know, this can't spill out to, you know, the neighborhood, it just has to stay within. Because they're a religious institution, are they like untouchable? Like they can do whatever they want in there because, you know, they're helping people or, you kind of see where I'm going with this? Yeah, but this is not, this is not like um, transitional housing. This is actual housing. So these, these okay. are um, rental units, they have leases. Um, I think that, Saying that they're going to be providing services is is a little bit misleading because uh, that's not the main thing. The housing is the main thing, so they're going to be careful who they're leasing to. I mean, they don't want bad tenants; they're, they're landlords above all else. But they're also looking to help people. Okay, uh, understood. Thank you. I want to remind um, the commissioners, council, everyone: supportive housing and transitional housing are already uses that are allowed in our residential zones. We were required to make those amendments to the code. Um, looks yeah. like back in 2017, when state law said that those were uses that had to be allowed by right in residential zones. So it's, I don't think it's something to be that worried about because it's already allowed in, um, the residential zones, and we haven't seen any kind of influx of that. Okay. okay, thank you for the clarification. Yeah, but those are very good questions. Um, as far as this goes, the strategy that the city is hoping to use is to use a, um, an overlay zone for the, the religious uh, institutional sites or the church sites or the, or the temple sites or whatever, the mosque sites that are in commercial and, and industrial zones, just so that they can enjoy the, the benefit of this without any further um, hurdles or hindrances or the need to do a, a, you know, a zone change. Or a lot of them are already in residential zones and so they're good to go. But we would identify them all and then and, you know, they would be identified in the, in the housing element as one of our strategies. Now, this is entirely voluntary. Any church could do this, but any church could also just opt not to not do this. Okay, next. We'll have a quick question about this uh, religious right. institutions though. Uh, okay. This is Councilman Tanaka. Mm -hmm. So this Placentia uh, Church of the Blessed Sacrament, it, it's pretty big. So yeah. we, have, we have churches in our city that are kind of small. So in, instead of housing, would they be able to put up ADUs on their property? Yeah, they, that, I mean, small houses, yeah. There's no, um, there's no minimum. Now, there wouldn't be ADUs per se, but they could do smaller, smaller units. Um, Council Member Tanaka, that's actually one of um, the ideas that we've been talking about as a staff level to bring back is um, to ha allow a certain number of smaller units uh, on the smaller properties. Uh, ADU type units um, 
that would provide some housing there. Uh, we, we've actually had some, at a staff level, some meetings with uh, two different religious groups or nonprofits that support this type of housing, and that was what they've indicated that some of the other cities are doing in the, in the area in Southern California to allow smaller type units be placed on smaller church properties. Because as Greg says, every unit helps, especially when we're at the affordable level, where we've had no affordable housing developed in um, the past five years. So, and then in response to Mayor Serta talking about transitional housing. So I worked at the mission for 12 years and we put people in transitional housing and they had to pay rent and they had to do a lot of stuff. So there actually isn't anything that says that you can't put a transitional person in one of these properties on the church. Is that correct? Correct. I just think that the, uh, the impetus behind this is a little bit different. Well, but, it, but it's but it's you're right. It's not necessarily um, required that this can't be used for transitional housing. But right. yeah. But going back to your earlier question about ADUs, um, yes. we saw a presentation where the city of, of Riverside there was a church that had a smaller bit of land, actually quite a small piece of surplus land, and they put what looked like four tiny ADUs on there, and that worked out really quite nice for them. Okay. So sometimes it works. Okay, thanks. Um, we have a we have a hand up. Uh, this is uh, Commissioner Langley. Um, wasn't there also? I, I'm vaguely remembering when we were talking about AB 1851 that there was a reduction in the uh, amount of uh, parking that would be required. Um, is that true, or am, yeah, am I at least dreaming? On the <laughs> side, South that that's correct, Commissioner Langley. AB 1851 allows for uh, the sharing of parking between the residential use and the church uses. I think up to about where you can take about 50 percent of the church's required parking. You still need to have required parking for um, the housing, but again, usually affordable housing has a much lower parking requirement than market rate housing. These are people who have zero to no, you know, to maybe one vehicle. So um, um, a church that has no excess land like this beautiful one that we're looking at, mm -hmm. um, but is totally, you know, um, I, I can think of many churches in Gardena. They could uh, reapply for less parking or shared parking so they could do this? In theory, they could apply to build, um, if they had no surplus, you know, grassland or whatever on the parking lot, sure. But if they're using that every Sunday, they probably wouldn't want to do that. But we have churches where they're where their congregation has dropped to the point where they couldn't fill the parking lot even on Easter Sunday. And they're looking at this very seriously as a way of uh, preserving the church. Uh, Greg, I have a question. Sure. So going to Commissioner Langley's uh, question, if the church wanted to build, are we gonna allow it to build it even though they're gonna take out of their parking spaces? Well, the law says we have to. Come on, come on. Where are they going to park the people then? On the streets? <laughs> well, AB 1851 requires us to, to do this. It doesn't oh allow God. for parking. It, oh. it allows for 50% of the religious institution parking to be used for uh, development of affordable housing. I, I, I think it's important to, to remember, though, that a church that fills its parking lot on Sunday is probably not going to be coming to us to build housing. It's the ones that are having a, a you know, decline in their, in their um, parishioners that are going to be looking for ways to make money and stay in the business. So how does a nonprofit make money? 
No, the nonprofit is is the one that partners with them. They go and get grants and such. That's how I mean they're they're in the business of building affordable housing. They don't make money. They they just break even basically. Oh, come on, if there is a dollar sign at the end, believe me, they'll find a way. No, that's not how they operate. They um they may make enough to pay their staff, and that's what they're trying they're trying to provide housing. But a uh, 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 Mr. Langley again. But a church could create its own nonprofit to do this, couldn't it? No, no, that's not. Yep. Uh, I don't think that's. Um... It it could probably set create some separate um, entity, but it, in fact, churches are as as has been pointed out to us by the two different groups we've sat down with, churches aren't developers. Right. They don't know how to go out and get the grants. They don't know how to work with the cities. Um, they don't know how to develop plans. And that's why there's this symbiotic relationship that is uh, developing between the churches. And I want to say by churches, we're, we all mean religious institutions. We're just using that shortcut um and these other types of and nonprofit housing groups um, i'm looking for the name i know there's one nonprofit group that is in part headed by somebody who's head of the arroyo or one of the principals of the arroyo planning group and arroyo does a lot of general plan um, master plans, specific plans for cities. So they bring in people who have development and planning experience to work with them to create this. The reason I answered your question, um, Commissioner Langley, with a no, is because there's almost no possibility that a church forming a nonprofit developer would have a chance of getting any of the necessary grants or loans that would be needed to build anything. They have no track record. They they wouldn't even qualify for a construction loan. It's, I was giving more of a realistic assessment. But one of the nonprofit groups is called Making Housing and Community Happen. And um, I think they those are one of the groups who has made presentations and again they bring in the urban design planning to the churches yeah there was a asian guy that uh, is nonprofit building uh, low income and he was on that uh, last uh, zoom thing that we had for the for the cog it might be the same person we saw lisa it, it could be yeah he's doing a lot of units yeah, and he's doing that mostly pro bono too. Yes. Yeah. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, great, let's move on then. Okay, um, this is just a, <coughs> sort of a broader view. I tried to identify all, all of the churches um, that could possibly be, be interested um, and I, again, I'm, we're not excluding um, temples and shrines and, and mosques or, or anything. We're just using church as a shorthand. Um, the, in, the, in the top third of, this, of the city, we found these. And the one in red is, is a commercial zone. The yellow ones are residential zones. And the, the blue ones are industrial. So the red and the blue ones would be candidates for the overlay. The, the ones in the residential zones are already good to go. If they wanted to build residential, they can do it without even ask, I mean, without even having to ask for a change of zone or a change of the general plan. They just need to get building permits at this point. Um, next slide. So here, here's the middle of the city. Uh, there's nothing behind the, the legend there to see. Uh, but everything in this part is either commercial or residential. So overlay would be applied to the pink ones and the other ones are, are already in residential. And then the last slide, same thing. So that just gives you a perspective on how many churches we were able to identify. Um, there's, there's, 
very likely to be some more um, that we didn't find, but they'll but we'll we'll be scouring through the I almost said yellow pages, but I'm just <laughs> dating myself. <laughs> but we'll be looking hard to find any others so we can put them in this uh, housing element update. Okay, next. Yeah, there's a map where we put them all in there at once. Just to give you an idea how many we found, I mean, like I said, that's probably not all of them, but that's that's a pretty good number. But that's um, that's the extent of where we think we can um, put the overlay or or possibly see some development on on institutional properties. Any uh, any questions at this point? Okay, next slide. All right, so this is sort of a summary. Um, obviously, the number is huge. It's much more than we need. So what we would be doing is we would um, not offer up everything. We would be scaling back where we can just to try to get, hit the number plus the buffer and not much more. But we'll keep the rest of them in the back pocket just in case uh, HCD rejects a, a lot of them, which is a high probability. They're, they're good at nitpicking all the sites that cities uh, submit, so then we'll have backups to, to throw in there. Um, but a lot of that will be done in public hearings with the Planning Commission and City Council in the near future. So, uh, but we'll, we'll be weeding through it first so that we don't have to spend like 12 hours in meetings doing this in public. We'll be weeding through it with our um, housing element consultant because she's very good at, at knowing what they're looking for in the state. And so she'll be doing the first uh, calling of the, of the sites. But you can see that we're, by the looks of it, we're probably over nine, no, we're probably at 10,000 almost, maybe 9,000 something. So we have a lot, of, uh, a lot of work ahead of us still. Okay, next slide. Oh, any questions? Okay, next slide. Um, if anybody um, was curious about affordable housing in general in Gardena, this is a project that was uh, already built. This is um, recent experience. I wasn't here for this, of course, but if anybody, um, well, Lisa, you were probably the most familiar with it. Why don't you describe what's um, going on here? This is the Spring Park Senior Affordable Housing Project. I believe it was city land that it was built on because it is... Um, well, I think because that's the way it would have worked out financially. Um, it is 59 units to the acre. And while the site plan is kind of small, it um, on the lower right hand corner, it does have a lot of amenities. And I think they do provide services for the seniors right on site. And it, we just put that in there because I think sometimes when people think affordable housing, they think of basically cement buildings that are, you know, no reliefs, no, um, Amanda, what's the, what's the word I'm looking for when there's the different textures and depths of the building? Um, but the project... The, the projects, in fact, can be attractive. And we just want to point out that we already do have this in Gardena at a density of 59 units. So it won't look like a compound. It's the, there's, thank you. That's the word. That's the word I was looking for. And, yeah. and I think part of what we have to do for our next step, and one of the reasons why I had urged we move straight into starting the zoning after we get, you know, housing element done, or while we're doing it, is we need to come up with the development regulations that will make sure we get attractive projects, to make sure that we have setbacks that will not be so excessive that it would prohibit 
the housing, but that we put in that it has to be, you know, have some sort of interest or we'll come up with the objective standards reliefs. That's more of the planners than me coming up with it right now. I think that's very important. If you if you don't do that, you do run the risk of somebody taking advantage and building a, a concrete box with holes. And that's not what I think anybody wants to see. Um, Lisa, how many units are in this project? Do you know? I think it's 37. It's on about 0.6 acres. Okay. So 37 doesn't look like that much. That's good. And this one is on El Segundo and Wilton Place. I remember this project. I was the commissioner then. Yes, correct. That's exactly where it is. And this property right now, and I can't remember if we rezoned it to that, um, is a fish or open space official zoning because senior affordable housing is allowed in that zone. Okay, next slide. Okay, great. We got to the end. It didn't. It wasn't. Uh, didn't take as long as I thought. Um, at this time, any questions about the housing element in general, or the the, the six or strategies that we've outlined, or any comments or? Uh, this is Mayor Brooks. I'm Henderson. I just wanted to state that. Again, the, the the arena number is a is a goal and everything, and I think the state and and SCAG are aware that in some instances, a lot of communities won't be able to reach that goal. But this is our proposed plan because we have to submit a plan to how we would achieve the goal. Then this does meet the requirement of us not skirting our legal responsibility. Now, whether it happens or not, we won't be held accountable for these developments not occurring because a lot of these properties are still owned by private property owners, correct? That's exactly correct. That was a very good summation. Um, Commissioner Langley, um, question I guess I have is public perception of what we're doing. Um, do we have to change the zoning of all these lands before we present it to whoever's going to look this thing over and if no. so um i can see a lot of people upset with their property their private property all of a sudden they can't do what they thought they could do on their own property when they bought it so yeah. what what how the overlay has something to do with this right Wait, right. commissioner greg if i may please um, Commissioner Langley, what we do first is we identify the sites in our housing element. And the housing element is required to identify where the affordables, where, where the very low, low moderates can be built. Um, and I don't want to mislead the council or commission or public because Greg and I very carefully looked at the law and once it's identified in the housing element for affordable, then regardless of what the zoning or land use is, we have to allow affordable housing to be built there at the level that was identified. But what we are talking about doing for most of these sites is to do an overlay zone or call it a mixed use you know, another type of mixed use zone like we have, where you can do either the commercial or the housing. So these overlay zones would allow the underlying commercial and industrial uses to stay as legal conforming uses or a new commercial and industrial use could go in their place. That's opposed to if you just did a straight rezone of the property where you turned commercial into residential, then you couldn't bring in a new commercial use or redevelop for um, a different type of commercial building. Well, what about an R3 that has a single house on it and then a, a person buys it and simply wants to tear down the existing single house and build a bigger single dwelling on that property? 
that, they could still do that, right? Well, that will be one of the things we're bringing before the planning commission. I understand right now we're, we're kind of giving you a, a real 10,000 um, foot look <laughs> at this. We expect to have a number of planning commission meetings where we look at not only the sites, but also what do you want to do? One of the ideas that staff has been talking about is in the R3 zone, it really isn't a good use of the land to build a single family um, or a duplex on property that's zoned for R3 and can accommodate six or more units. That, but again, those are policy calls for the planning commission. Do we want to take out um, do we want to take out those types of uses and not allow R1, R2, or do you want to leave it as it is and people who want to develop the R3s as we've seen a number of those projects can do it? Okay. We're not deciding that tonight. We're not even deciding that necessarily when we put the housing element forward. And truthfully, the R3 lots are not going to be identified for affordable housing because it financially wouldn't be feasible if you're only doing six units on um, the lot as we've seen so many projects to make it affordable. Uh, I, I, I guess what I'm saying is to get past who we have to get past, do we have to rezone? Eventually we will, but by an overlay. Again, by, the, by using the overlay. But to get past HCD, we are simply identifying the sites. Okay, thank you. I think uh, it's important that we provide you with many options on how to get there. And you know, any any one except for the rezoning won't get us there. <clears throat> so that we don't want to rely on rezoning. And especially having the option of an overlay is a great option because it doesn't change what people can do with their property. It, it enhances what they can do with their property. It adds another option. And that's usually welcomed, not not uh, not something that people dislike. They like having more options. I, I, I agree. I, yeah. I, I just I, I, I was worried about the limiting of options. Yeah, that is, well, exactly. We're, we're not planning on doing that um, unless, unless it's absolutely necessary. But seeing the numbers that we're coming up with, we're exceeding our goal by quite by 50%. I don't, I don't see that as a likely outcome of this. Um, it's very unlikely that we would even have to consider that. Okay. Thank you, Greg. Are there any other questions? Any other comments? Anyone? Okay. Um, in that case, uh, Madam Mayor, I'd like to turn the meeting back over to you. Do you have any closing comments? Okay, thank you. Um, well, let me just say, uh, yes, I just want to thank you guys for uh, putting on this workshop. Uh, a lot of great information here. Um, you know, I believe we've all learned a lot from this. So uh, thank you for that. I know it's a lot, a lot of work that was put into this here. So uh, with that being said, we're going to go ahead and uh, move to adjournment. The Guardian City Council and Planning and Environmental Quality Commission will adjourn to uh, the regularly scheduled planning commission meeting, which will be at 7 p.m. on Tuesday, April 6, 2021. And the city council will adjourn to the closed session portion of the city council meeting at 7 p.m., followed by the regular city council meeting at 7.30 p.m. on Tuesday, April 13th, 2021. We are adjourned. Okay, thank you everyone for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night.